Thank you, Melissa, for that music. Uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a special today, so uh, I'll be praying about singing specials for us, and uh, we always invite uh, anyone who wants to sing to be able to come in and sing for us, and so be praying about that. And uh, no pressure. It's the most nerve-wracking thing you'll ever do, but no pressure. Amen. Y'all be sure and be in prayer for uh, uh, John and Randy. Uh, they're they're both kind of nervous about October the 29th and uh, and uh, November the 5th, but we know that uh, our God is able, and uh, so y'all be in prayer for them. And uh, and I'm kind of excited about it myself, and uh, to see what God's going to do. Don't forget about the youth tonight at six o'clock. Come and hear what uh, what our youth have to say to us, uh, and and be blessed by by them. I thank God for our youth group. You know when you look around. Uh, you, you don't see anybody in here that's, that's got a suit on. Now, there's nothing wrong with wearing suits. There's nothing wrong with it at all. But, folks, it's not a requirement to be a, uh, to go to church. And you, you look around and you see children, you see babies, you see teenagers, you see moms and dads, you see grannies and grandpas. That's a good mix, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Why? Because Christ died for us all, every one of us. You know what? He, he don't look at color. He don't look at nationality. He don't look at gender. He don't look at those things. He looks at the human heart. And he is here to save people. Amen? That's what he has come here for. That's what he died for is to save us. And not only to save us, but to save us to the uttermost. Amen? Uh, that means when he saves you, he's got you. Amen? Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ has your back. Amen? And he, he uh, when he saves you, he places you in the Father's hand. And I dare anybody to try to get you out of that hand. Amen? I don't think it's possible. You know, we got some visitors. We want to uh, thank God for all of our visitors today. We've got many visitors today. Uh, some of them uh, go way, way back with me. And uh, so if they tell you all any stories, don't believe a word of it. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, what we, were, we, we marvel at is we're here together in the house of God. And, and uh, there, I have another friend that I used to run around with. As a matter of fact, we were almost like uh, like Siamese twins. You never saw us apart hardly ever. And he said the other day that uh, that he's been thinking about coming and, and hearing me preach and Johnny Crow is going to sing to him when he gets here. And so when you look at the goodness and the greatness of our Lord, folks, God can save anyone. Amen? Amen. And when He saves us, there needs to be a change that takes place in our lives and in our hearts. That old man that I was is dead in God. Amen? He's nailed to the cross with Jesus. And I'm so thankful that we have the mercy and the grace of God who can save anyone. Amen? Amen. Amen. He can save anyone. So if you're here today and you're lost, I've got some good news for you. Jesus Christ still saves today. Amen? Amen? And if you'll just come to Him, He'll be more than glad to, to save your soul and to give you His Holy Spirit and give you the power to live for Him. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Galatians? book of Galatians, we're going to be reading in chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Galatians is a, is a very, very interesting book. It's one that Paul wrote. It, it gives a lot, in uh, chapter 1 gives a lot of, of the history of Paul and what happened with him uh, after he was saved and, and where he went. And, and, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2, he starts in, in uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, rather, uh, that, that he talks about what happened to him after his salvation experience and where he went. And then chapter 2 starts 14 years later when he came back uh, to Jerusalem to compare notes with the disciples. And so uh, he, he was a, uh, a great missionary. He was a great man of God. And, and yet, you know, Paul himself made a remark in one of his letters that he felt like he was the chiefest of sinners. Can you imagine that, that Paul felt that way? He also gave us the kind of tongue twister uh, 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 scripture that he said, those things that I, I know I need to do, I don't do. And those things that I know I don't need to do are exactly the things that I do. And he kind of describes the way all of us live. Amen? All of us live that way because we, we, we know that we're supposed to do this and we know we're supposed to do that, but somehow or another we just don't do those things. And sometimes we think, I know I'm not supposed to do this, and despite our best efforts, that's exactly what we do. 
And we call it being human, but you know what? <laughs> Regardless of what you call it, it's still sin against God. It's still sin against God. And so it, it tells us and shows us our great need for a Savior who lived a sinless life, and that's Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2, begin reading in verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Bless it to our hearts and speak to our hearts today like you've never done before. And Lord, we're going to give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. When you look at this scripture and you look at, the, at, at what happens before this, we find that, that Paul had had a little disagreement or a confrontation with, uh, with Peter. Uh, Peter had been one that had been uh, called first. And if you look at Acts chapter 10, he was on our rooftop one day praying. He was hungry and the Lord gave him this vision and this sheet of unclean animals came down and the Lord commanded him to take this and eat and he would say, no, I'm not supposed to eat this stuff. He did it three times. There was a knock on the door and there were some Gentiles that were sent to this place to bring Peter to a man's uh, house called Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was, according to the, the uh, book of Acts, he was the first uh, Gentile that was, uh, that was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was saved. And, and it opened the door for the Gentiles to, be, uh, to become Christians. And so the, 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 Lord, the Lord told Peter, he said, I don't want you to, he said, when you look at this stuff, he said, uh, he said, I want you to realize that anything that I have cleansed, don't you dare call it unholy or unclean or common. He told Peter that in Acts chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, because Peter thought the Gentile people were unclean. And so when, when, uh, when years had gone by and many Gentiles had been saved and they came to Jerusalem to have a feast uh, with, with, the, with the Jewish believers. And when they got there, guess what they did? Peter and his Jewish believers sat at one table and they wouldn't sit with the Gentiles. Amen? We call that today hypocrisy, by the way. Amen? And, but Peter had reverted back to the Jewish law that forbid them to dine with a Gentile person. And so although, and so, so Peter had not learned this lesson very well. And we all are guilty of that if we're not careful. We'll all get saved and the Lord opens up all these doors. You know, if you brought a group of black people into the church and you said, well, we're going to have a fellowship back here, if you're not careful, you'd wind up with all the white folks sitting at one table and all the black folks sitting at the other table. You're not having fellowship at all, amen? You're separating yourself. And the Lord says he doesn't want any part of that. So Paul had confronted Peter about that and, and told him, he said, you didn't do right. And sometimes we have to do that with each other. Sometimes we have to call each other's bluff and, and say, you know, you can't talk about a certain group of people this way. You can't act a, uh, to, toward a certain group of people this way. The ones that people, the, the people that Jesus Christ has saved belong to Christ. And, and like it or not, when He saves somebody, we all become brothers and sisters in Jesus. Amen? It don't make any difference what color you are or what nationality you are or what, uh, what background you have, how rich you are, how poor you are, how well-dressed you are, or how scrawny you look. It don't make any difference to the Lord about those things. 
What makes a difference to the Lord is that you have received Jesus Christ as Savior and you are filled with the Holy Spirit and now we have a fellowship and we are bound by Jesus Christ to love one another. Amen? Amen. And to treat one another with great dignity, with great respect. As a matter of fact, Paul teaches us that we are to esteem others greater than ourselves. Wouldn't this be a wonderful world? If everybody thought of their neighbor as being better than they are themselves. Amen? You would just start treating people better. Jesus gave us the golden rule. He said, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Wouldn't this be a beautiful world if we did those things? Just those two things right there. That we esteem others greater than ourselves. And we did unto everybody if we would have everybody to do unto us. This place would be a lot easier to live in. Amen? We would be a lot better people. The churches would just be flourishing because Christians would go out and people would actually see Jesus Christ living in their lives. Both one of the great downfalls of our Christianity today is people don't see Jesus in us. Amen? And so Paul begins to address this situation. He gets down to verse 16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, Folks, Peter could not justify what, the way he acted toward the Gentile people by the law because Peter didn't live under the law anymore. Amen? T Peter was not saved by the law. And folks, you, you can compare the law today to, uh, to works that we have as Gentiles. Folks, it don't make any difference how good you act. You're not saved by your actions. You're not saved by your works. You are saved and justified because Jesus Christ died for you. And that's the only way that we can be saved, the only way we can be justified. And he, and he went on to say, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, this is the way you're justified. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Amen? And not by the works of the law. And we're not justified by our works either. Folks, works is, are great things. They cannot save you. And I know that we're beating a dead horse here. We say this all the time. We said this so many times right here in, in this church house. We're not saved by the good works. We are saved and then we do good works. Amen? We got it all backwards somehow or another. And a lot of people think as long as I'm doing good, I'm okay. Folks, you're never okay unless Jesus Christ has saved your soul. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're never okay. I don't care how many good works you do because the good works will not get you anywhere. And so we, we, we somehow or another in, the, in this generation and in the generations of the past, somehow or another, we've gotten to the point where we think, okay, I'm not saved by works, so why do them? And so we need to get away from this idea and we need to realize that we are justified because Jesus Christ died for us and saved us. But when we are saved and justified, now we need to start performing good works to do it for His glory, to do it for His honor, to do it for His praise so people can see Jesus Christ in us. The whole idea of Jesus dwelling in us is that He can do the works that He came to do through us. Amen? And He empowers us to do those works. And in order for us to do that, we've got to live a certain lifestyle. The lifestyle that depicts Jesus Christ is in control of us. Amen? Amen? And we've gotten so far away from that. And, and, and so we, we, we need to get back to the, the basics of Christianity. And I think we can find the very basics of Christianity in, the, in these scriptures right here. Number one, we are justified only by Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus Christ, not by any works. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found, listen to this, sinners... <laughs> Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For some reason, we have used the excuse that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So since all are sinners, it's okay for us to sin. We can't help ourselves. Is that what the scripture tells us? Well, that's what I used to believe. I did. I used to live just like that. I thought that I could just sin all I wanted to and it was okay. You know what it ain't? ain't okay. I'm sorry for that South Arkansas. It ain't okay. It's not okay to sin. 
You're never justified through sin. And Paul wants to remind us and tell us whether we're Gentile or whether we're Jewish. He said, when you tell people that you are justified by Christ and then you yourself are found to be a sinner, you know what that makes us? It makes us a disgrace to the grace that God has given us. If we have the mindset, oh, I can sin, I can do this, I can do anything I want to, and I'm already saved. Folks, you got that attitude, you better look at your salvation experience. You may not have the goods. Amen? Amen. A saved person should never, ever want to sin. A saved person should never, ever try to justify their own sin because they say, well, it's everybody else is doing it or I'm not doing as bad as old so-and-so over here. Amen? We never need to try to justify ourselves that way. Folks, we are called out to darkness into His marvelous light. Amen? And the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines down upon us and brings the, to, to light the sin in our lives. It's dirty. It's like when you flip the light on and that big cockroach runs across your cabinet. He can't stand the light. That's the way sin ought to be in our lives. It ought to flee from us. Amen. Because we know Jesus Christ. And we know that He is the light. And He says we cannot be found as sinners because when you act like everybody else, people is not seeing Jesus Christ in you. Amen. How many of you believe that uh, there are a lot of people that the only Christ they ever see is in a person? Amen? There's a lot of them. The only Bible a lot of people ever read is a Christian man's walk with Jesus Christ. And we say, well, well, well it's not right to put that much pressure on us. Folks, the Bible in John 3.17 says that Jesus Christ came not into the world to condemn the world. It's not our job to condemn sinners. It's not our job to condemn anybody. Why? He went on in verse 18 of John chapter 3, and he says, because they are condemned already. He didn't have to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. Lost people are already condemned. And if they don't come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, they will die condemned, and they will go to hell because they have condemned their own self by rejecting Jesus. And folks, we don't never ever need to live, live our lives and try to, 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 to say it's okay for us to sin because we're saved. Now how ridiculous does that sound? And yet we do it all the time. We live our lives just that way. And Paul says, do we make Jesus Christ the minister of sin? Because see, you look at me and you say, well that's the minister right there. Folks, I look at you, we're all ministers of Jesus Christ. We are called to live for Him. And, and we are called to represent Him. We are called to share people, share Him with other people. We are called to live our lives so other people see Jesus in us. And folks, there are a lot of people who have it in their minds that it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that, it's, and it's not okay. And where we get all thinking it is, I don't know. Well, what do you say? Well, what do I do? Stop it! Stop doing what it is that's a sin in your life. Change! Do what's right in the, in, in the eyes of God, not what's wrong. And you know what? I found out something else. When I have sinned, I tend to run from Jesus. I tend to hide from the light until I'm clean again. <clears throat> Amen? Folks, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a good thing. Because if you feel conviction in your heart and in your life over a sin you committed, that's a good thing because that tells me that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you and is convicting you of that sin and trying to bring you back into a right relationship with the Savior. That's what conviction does. What do we usually do when we get convicted? We hide ourselves from God. And that's the wrong thing to do. We need to run to the cross, not away from it when we sin. Why? Because forgiveness is found right there. Amen? The Bible says that He died for us. He shed His blood for us. That when we do sin and commit sin, it's not an excuse. It's not a reason we are sinners and we mess up. Despite the best efforts we put out, we're just going to mess up. Amen? How many of you don't do that? I do it all the time. My wife's constantly saying, mm -hmm. you don't need to be doing that. Amen. I'm scared to tell her that. She tells me that all the time. She told somebody this morning that I have road rage, and guess what I do? <laughs> have you ever been going along there by yourself, 
and somebody cut you off or somebody do something stupid around you and you just go ballistic and you start screaming and hollering and all of a sudden you come to this realization and the Lord kind of pecking you on the shoulder the whole time you're doing it and you're ranting and you're raving and all of a sudden you're saying, who am I talking to? <laughs> Amen? I, it happened to me just the other day. <laughs> just about every time I drive it happens. <laughs> And I was driving along there and I was talking bad about this fellow. I don't know who this guy was. And he really didn't do anything that bad. He just tripped my trigger. And that's what he did. And I was sitting there talking bad about this fellow. You know, calling down fire from heaven to smack that truck. And all of a sudden, just like a voice spoke to me, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? Listen to yourself. Now guess what I got to do? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't mean to act that way. You know why? And I was by myself. <laughs> Folks, we need to learn to do that when we're in the presence of other people too. When we say something vulgar, we need to feel that conviction and apologize right then and say, I'm sorry to the Lord. Amen. Because it's available. And he says, he said, so and when you do these things, you try to make Christ the minister of sin by saying it's okay for me to sin because I can't help it. You think that's going to hold water when we stand in judgment before him? Lord, you know me. I just couldn't help myself. He said, yeah, I died for you so you could help yourself. I gave you my Holy Spirit so you would have the power to help yourself. Amen. I gave you the fruit of the Spirit, and one of those fruit is, is forbearance, and one of them is temperance, which is self-control. I gave you everything you needed to control yourself. So don't come to me telling me you don't can't control yourself because you can, because I'm your Lord, and I know you could if you would rely on me. Folks, you know what's wrong with the church today? We're not relying on Jesus Christ and about as much as we should. Amen. Amen. We're not relying on the power and the might of the Holy Spirit like we should. We don't even believe in that power, I don't think, anymore. We don't believe in the altars of God anymore. We don't believe in repentance anymore. Folks, the Bible is full of, of, of situations where people refuse to repent. And guess what happened to them? God destroyed them. Destroyed their nations. Destroyed their cities because they would not repent. Amen? And so we are called into this relationship with Jesus Christ. We are justified only because He died for us and we have faith in Him. That's our justification. And I'm so thankful to, to, to know that, you know, God knows the difference between accidental sin and sin on purpose. Uh -huh. Y'all ain't never thought, heard this preached like this before, have you? You know, it's one thing to be going along there and something go wrong and boom, you sin. But it's another thing to think about it and do it anyway. It's another thing to do it and continue to do it and keep on doing it and keep on doing it and say, it's all right, I'm saved. Really? You really think God sees it that way? We become a disgrace to grace. And he said, you cannot make Jesus Christ a minister of sin. And you are not a minister of Jesus Christ if you live in sin on purpose. Amen. Comfortable ignorance ain't going to plead with God. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us His Son. He's given us His Word. He's given us all the power we need to live for Him. He's given us His Word so we'll know how to live for Him. And folks, when we decide that we are not going to live that way, we spit on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. We just do and so when you look at these things and you look at the way we're supposed to live, we are supposed to be a changed people. And then he goes on in verse 18. I know i got to move on. He said, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Amen? Now, wouldn't it be something? Because I know how I was when I got saved. I know how I was before I got saved. Gay, gay here knows how I was before I got saved. <laughs> Now, wouldn't it be something, Gay, if I got saved and I was that same man again? You wouldn't hold much store in my salvation, would you? Amen. But you know what? I'm a new man now. You know why? Because there's a new king on my throne in my heart. His name is Jesus Christ. He forgave me for all that junk. 
He forgave me for every bit of that. He cleansed me of my unrighteousness. He saved my soul. He made me a new creation, a new creature. All that old junk is gone. And I don't have to deal, deal with it anymore. It's gone. And I'm forgiven. But now I have to live my life for Him. I have to live my life to give Him glory. I have to get, live my life to give Him praise. I had to live my life so people can see Him in me. And I cannot live in fornication. I cannot live in adultery. I cannot live a thief. I cannot live a lie. I can't live a vulgar life and let people see Jesus in me. It's not there. Amen? I cannot make Jesus Christ the minister of sin. And so when I go back to the way I was, the Bible says the dog cannot, it will return to its vomit. People get grossed out by that. But you know what? That's a better picture of sin and us returning back into our sin than I can think of. He said you can't wash the pig and turn him loose. He ain't going to stay clean. He's going to go back to the mire. You know, we look at that and say, well, that's who I am. I'm the pig that went back to the mire. That's a shameful, disgusting thing for us to say because we're not pigs. We're people. Amen? Amen? And the pig can get by with that. People cannot. Amen? When the Lord Jesus Christ saves your soul, there is something that happens to us. We become different. And we can't revert back to who we were. Amen? It's not supposed to happen. Look in verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I, listen to this, here's, here's the part that hangs us up. I might live unto God. Folks, when Jesus Christ saved us, that old man is destroyed. Now, we are supposed to live unto God. That means live God's way. Live our lives in agreement with God's Word. To realize that when we, and you know what, part of His Word is that when we do sin, we can confess that sin, and He's faithful and just to forgive us that sin, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from that unrighteousness. He has made a way for us because He knows how imperfect we are. And we need to be sure we take full advantage of the blood of Jesus. And quit thinking for some reason, well, I'm saved, I've sinned, it's automatic forgiveness. That's not scriptural at all. Not at all. It requires effort on our part. When we feel conviction, which is our alarm, it goes off in us, our, our reaction to conviction should be to hit our knees and confess our sin and change from that sin. Amen? <laughs> that's what it does so we go on and he says I gotta live and I love this next scripture it's one of the favorite scriptures in the Bible Paul shows us in verse 20 he said I am crucified with Christ amen how many of you believe you have been crucified with Jesus Christ you better get your hands up if you think you're saved amen because he says I am crucified with Christ but you know what he said nevertheless I live and that was a confusing thing to those Jewish people and those the, the Gentiles that were hearing this because they knew what crucifixion was and they knew the violent death that was involved in it and the agonizing death that was involved. And Paul made a remark that I was crucified with Jesus, but I live. You know what? A lot of people say, well, I'll die for Jesus. He don't want you dying for him. He died for you. Amen? He wants you to live for him. And i got news for you. Those people that say I'll die for Jesus is not living for Him. I ain't going to die for Him either. Amen? If you don't have the power to live for Him, don't look for the power to die for Him. Amen? And so we need to understand this. And he said, so I am crucified with Jesus. Nevertheless, I live. But listen to this. Here's the, here's the whole key to everything. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You know why a lot of people can't live for Jesus that are trying to? Because Jesus don't live in them. I told y'all this before, and I saw a new statistic the other day about Billy Graham. You, know, you can rest assured Billy Graham is a man like I am. But you know what? He made a remark when he first started preaching that he, he felt like 20% of all the people that sat on the church pews were lost. When he got to be an old man, 
up around 80, he's still preaching. You know what he said? I've got a feeling that about 80% of all the people who church, sit on church pews are lost. His mind changed from the time he was a young evangelist until he was an old evangelist just because of the way he had seen the people who are supposed to be Christians live. Amen? That had made Jesus Christ a minister of sin in their lives. That had used the blood of Jesus as an excuse to be able to do anything they wanted to do. And it was going to be okay. Folks, that's not the way it is. He says, Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in this flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, i got a lot of making up to do. Amen? I owe Jesus a debt I can't ever repay back. As long as I live, if I just begged Him every day and live for Him every day, I couldn't pay back what He's done for me, what He's forgiven me for. And it's up to me to be filled with His Spirit and to realize in the life that I now live, although I'm still in the flesh, I live for Jesus. I live for Him. Why? Because he loved me and he gave himself for me. Folks, we make the remark all the time, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Jesus died for me. You know what Paul says? If you, if you say that, live it. Live it like you mean it. Actions speak louder than words, y'all. <coughs> and it's one thing to say I love Jesus. It's another thing to live like you love Jesus. And he says, the night life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God because He loved me and because He died for me. He made it personal to Himself. Amen? I love that phrase, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope you all have one. Amen? Amen? Because you can't live a relationship with Jesus Christ through your husband or your wife. You live it through yourself. Because He dwells in you. I'm going to go on to the next verse and I'm going to, I'm going to close this. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. You know why He said that? He lived every day of His life to promote Jesus Christ. To promote salvation. If you read the things that happened to the Apostle Paul, if a third of those things happened to me or you, we would quit sharing the gospel with anybody. But he didn't. He said, I live every day because he loved me and because he gave himself for me. And I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Folks, if righteousness comes to us, through the works. Jesus didn't need to die. But he did. I guess the question today. Do you live your life in such a way. That people know. Without a doubt. That Jesus Christ. Is your Savior. And your Lord. The life that you now live. Does it reveal that about you? Or do you frustrate the grace of God? You know what that means? It means you bring agony and pain to the grace of God. You bring agony and pain to the church of God. You bring agony and pain to the righteousness of God. And folks, if you frustrate the grace of God, you become that disgrace to grace. And you're not even usable by God. Which are you? How do you live? Do you live every day because you know Jesus Christ loves you and died for you and He dwells in you and you want people to see that? I hope you live your life that way. Would you stand, please? These altars are going to be open for prayer. It's my prayer to you for you today that if the Lord has spoken to you in any way, if He has shown you a sin in your life, 
or that you are a frustration to his grace. These altars are open for prayer. Would you please come up here and tell him you're sorry and you want to live for him from this day forward. Maybe you're here and you know you're living in sin. You know you're living in displeasure of the grace of God. Come up here and give him that sin and turn away from it and make it right before him. You, you have that power. Maybe you're here today and you say, I don't even feel like I have that power. I don't feel the conviction for my sin. Folks, come up here and let me tell you how to be saved. How Jesus Christ can love you and live in you and fill you with His Spirit and forgive you of your sin and give you that power to live for Him. Please bow your head. Close your eyes. Concentrate on Jesus Christ today. Concentrate on His goodness, on His grace, on His mercy, and realize how much He loves you. He said, Father, Nobody takes my life from me. I'm giving it. Who did he give it for? Gave it for me and you. He voluntarily let him nail him to the cross. He voluntarily took those lashes upon his back. He voluntarily toted that cross to a hill. And he voluntarily laid on that cross and they nailed him to it. So it didn't happen to me and you. What else could he do to show how much he loved you? No wonder he said, no greater man, no greater love has a man for another than that he will lay down his life Folks, he said, I can't show you any greater love than what I've shown you. I've laid down my life for you. Would you come to me? That's all he's saying. Come to me. His invitation to us, folks, is always come to me. If you're burdened, if you're heavy laden, come to him. If you have unresolved sin in your life, come to him. If you want deliverance from a sin, come to him. He said, I can handle that sin. I can handle your burden. Because I love you that much. Would you come? so much for being here today. God bless our visitors. Thank y'all for being here. All of you. Uh, just pray that the Lord has spoken to you in some way today. And that you leave this place today better equipped to go out there and show people Christ in you. I love all of you. Thank you for allowing me to preach to you. I'm like Missy. She gets to play for you. I get to preach to you. Amen. Amen. Because we love the Lord. Amen. Don't forget our service tonight at 6 o'clock. I can't wait to hear what these young folks have got to say. What you got? Nothing.
you want that one coming up? No, go ahead. Are well, you going to say that? <laughs> she got me confused now. <laughs> when they go, <clears throat> they won't say something. You don't say that? Okay. <laughs> if you get a chance, come back. Thank you and come again. And let's show Jesus every day in our lives that he's Lord, that he's king of our lives. Let people see Christ in us. Because see, he's the hope of of glory for every man, every woman, and every child. He's the answer to the problems of life. Not a politician, not lower taxes, not free health care. Jesus Christ <coughs> is that answer to all of it. Amen. Y'all remember the ones that are sick and hurting? Don't forget uh, Brother Gary Brantley shut up at home. Give him a call. Go by and see him. He lives at 104 North House Street in Atlanta. Sister Shirley is in room 220 at... Uh, Christmas St. Michael's Highland Hospital in uh, Shreveport on Burke Coons. She's in room 220. She'd love to uh, have a phone call from you and talk to you and and, uh, and tell her how much you love her and you're praying for her. They'd love that. We'll be in prayer for these folks. God bless you all. John Terry, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, dear Lord. I pray that... Uh, we just uh, have remembrance of your word, dear Lord, and that uh, we use it for our, our everyday living, dear Lord. I pray for all the ones on the prayer list, dear Heavenly Father, that you uh, show them your love and your comfort and your, your healing power, dear Lord. And pray your will be done, dear Heavenly Father. We love and praise you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.